Hi, I'm Joe Strelo. I'm president of AVL Test Systems for North America. And I'm sitting today with Dr. Ben Strayer. He's our regional business manager in charge of many of our software products. And we're going to talk a little today about autonomous and adaptive safety features and, and how we test for those things uh, in today's environment. So good morning, Ben. How are you good doing? Good morning. Yeah, nice to, nice to see you here on a nice snowy morning in Michigan. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, it's, uh, which is a great segue in because on a day like today, how does a customer test autonomous and NADAS functionality? Yeah, is, this get, a, is this a down day today? Well, no, I guess depending on the particular features that, that one might be trying to, to verify, validate, right? Maybe snowy conditions are the perfect case for, for running a certain number of tests that you would do kind of on the road. Again, if you wanted to do this in the middle of summer, now you have a problem. But you know, because <laughs> you the weather happened yourself. to afford you this, this <laughs> Today opportunity. Today was supposed to be a dry pavement day. It, it, exactly. <laughs> so I think this comes to kind of the heart of one of the challenges for mm -hmm. doing some of this on road testing is you can never guarantee what the road conditions are going to be like. You can't guarantee kind of what the surrounding traffic patterns are going to look like. So you're kind of left to, so to kind the of environment and to just the general transportation if you try to do on-road testing. So you're you're really, to get through an entire four seasons of testing, you're really stuck with four seasons or you have to move the vehicle around Correct. an awful lot. Right, so you'll see road trips to, to various locations or you'll see you know, people really trying to remove some of the on-road. Maybe they mm. do data collection on the road, right? So you're just collecting data from, from the fleet of vehicles. Okay. But then you need to look at what other environments can I use that are a little bit more reproducible so I can start to do more of the, of the day in and day out testing that I need to do. So this could be taking things from, from the open road to a proving ground, so a little bit more of a constrained environment. It could be trying to virtualize a lot of that, a lot of that work. So you have simulation models, you, have, you can simulate the environment and, and vehicle to vehicle. And now some of that work you could do in a, in a pure you know, simulation environment. Sure. So, so you go out on the road, you've, you've done a lot of this work, maybe in a simulation environment or in a control. Like, so we've been doing these events down at American Center for Mobility, for example. So you go out on the road. How confident are you at that point that, that everything works? And is, I know, you know people are getting licensed to or getting approved to do this work on actual public roads, but at that point, how confident are you? I, I think it really depends on the, the number of vehicles that you have out there and the amount of time that you've had for that particular vehicle. And I think the where it gets really interesting is if you think about a given vehicle in a particular environment, mm -hmm. right? you have a bunch of control systems that are interacting. And so if <laughs> the calibration of that vehicle right, has everything else that you need and you're out in this environment and you're doing the testing and perhaps like today it's snowing, Maybe you have higher confidence with, with the output of a particular test. But what happens when something else, some other calibration related to the overall vehicle architecture has changed? <laughs> so you have to ask yourself, does that test that I ran two weeks ago or a month ago with, a, with an older variant of that vehicle or the calibration still apply? Mm -hmm. right? How confident am I now that, that what I did is, is at a point that I can allow it to go out on a public road, right? In, in a production type environment. And I think these, this is kind of the, the challenge that our customers face today. Right? How they, often do you think they're changing these parameters? I, I, I think that's a great question. I think it depends on kind of the maturity of the customer, <laughs> right? <laughs> so you have a, a, a wide range, you know, people who are very early in, in doing their doing work and their work. feature development. Sure. Or you might have a more, let's say, traditional OEM, mm -hmm. let's say, that has been doing this for a long time and maybe they're, they have a very high confidence in the, in the feature mm -hmm. set. And so it's a bit more mature, but perhaps they're going to be more reluctant to do this out on the open road, on the public road, whereas a startup might be more, let's, know, let's scrappier say, go. Let's a just little get more, out there. Yeah. less risk averse, right? And a little more um, opportunistic of a condition, right, is, is there that it works for them. Right. I mean, we certainly see that, right? That, that if you're a GM, your, your aversion to risk because let's face it, I mean, they get crucified if something goes wrong. I mean, it becomes very public. But if you're a startup, you probably, you want to get your vehicles out there. And it, I mean, you look at, you know, some of our customers, they, they've gotten a pass on a lot of stuff. Right. And uh, so, yeah, it's, it, 
it's interesting. So the rules aren't even really the same. I mean, effectively. Correct. So, so okay. So you get your car and you've got you've got a parameter set in there. You have some confidence. You've maybe done some on road or some controlled road uh, development work. So you're, you're you've got some confidence. And now you go out on the road, and now you're fighting traffic, and you're fighting the weather, and and then you have to deal with all the randomness that comes from other drivers. And which, which is great for an <laughs> overall set of training data, right? And mm. different scenarios that perhaps you hadn't envisioned mm. up front, right? Because you can't, it's not easy to think about every conceivable scenario that may happen. Sure. And then yeah. how does my overall system respond to that scenario that I hadn't envisioned? So being out in the real world is definitely a huge value, right? And that, that data and that experience is, is, is there, but at some point, right, these vehicles have to go from the development stage into, you know, into production and a consumer ultimately is going to purchase that and go out on the road. Mm -hmm. And depending on where, where the level of autonomy is, is it a, you know, is the driver always having to actively be engaged with the, you know, with the vehicle and in, in the maneuver that it's, it's going through, or is it a very highly automated maneuver? And so you start to get into topics safety, um, um, liability, right? When, when something doesn't happen as, mm -hmm. as one would expect. And so again, it comes back to how um, standards for testing, but also how, how risk tolerant averse is, is a particular automaker in, in terms of getting this partic a particular technology into the field and you know, in customers' hands. And I think we see a lot of startups or let's maybe not so much startups, but relatively new players who have a lot of technology in the vehicle sure. and it's out on the road. And, and some might argue in some cases, the customer is actually collecting the data for some of, <laughs> the, of what they're doing. The, right? the, the proven ground driver, right. basically. Um, and then you have others maybe that the technology is there, but they haven't released it because they're, they're gotcha. very concerned about you know, having anything happen um, in, in the field. How much do you think variants of a vehicle so I'll, I'll pick on, uh, I'm looking at buying a new Chevy truck. So you can get the three quarter ton in, the, in a two wheel drive and then a four wheel drive is higher yet. And then they make the AT4. So it's, it's even higher yet. Right. So how, how much do you think it's gonna matter? So this is a big, it's a huge, a huge uh, variability that's there. And I think comes to, when you look at, there's going to be obviously impacts on parking sensors and your, you know, even blind spot and other, mm -hmm. right? Their field of view and how they interact with the environment, depending upon, you know, even as produced, but what about aftermarket modifications? These things all are in, uh, interacting. Right. But if you looked at from uh, producing this vehicle, right, and functional safety, and there's ISO standards 26262, for example, so that when you're doing this testing, you have to, in the end, say, that you've gone through the range of tests and you're confident in, 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 in how the vehicle is going to perform uh, on the road. Mm -hmm. But every vehicle variant adds a new level of complexity. It, there's calibration <laughs> differences between them, just like we've seen in the traditional space. And so what, what's, what we're seeing is that our customers who perhaps had one vehicle in the market and they had a small team that mm -hmm. was doing everything, now you're going to more full-line manufacturers with a particular vehicle like you described with a lot of variants. Right. And now not only do you have the calibration, all of those calibratable parameters for the for the powertrain itself or the propulsion system, but now all of the the ADAS or you know calibrations that may be needed for the feature set. And those all have to be maintained. And you need traceability from every single every single <laughs> every thing single that is being done. At some point, you need to be able to go back and say who made the change, what variant was it, what was the calibration of the rest of the of the rest of the system, because in the end, it's it's an overall system that you're that you're putting on the road. It's not a particular feature. So we're having more and more customers come and ask us how we would right support mm -hmm. them in in these very complex just managing the calibration side of it. So we have a lot of experience there. And now we have customers in the new space sure. coming and saying, well, wait a minute, I now have much larger teams, uh, one team that's only working on AEB, one on the lane keep. And now you have a bunch of different groups that in all the end have it. to pull everything they're doing, all of their calibrations together on top of an overall vehicle architecture that has its own calibration, right, parameters. 
and say, yes, this is this set is the validated set for that vehicle variant that's going into production, and then make sure that you know what's produced has that, has that, set. that set. And if anything were to ever happen, traceability to say what decisions were made for every single parameter that was calibrated through the whole history of that of that <laughs> who touched it last, yeah. exactly. So there's more uh, and more interest, right, from from how, how our many customers. parameters are we talking about? So I. One of my colleagues gave me just in the case of ADAS, kind of going going so from not like, autonomous, not, just not ADAS, autonomous, just right? And that's a whole safety. different thing. Maybe there's it's a different technologies sometimes are at play, right? It's not mm -hmm. necessarily always the same as um, individual calibrations for a particular feature. But I think the number he gave for just some of the ADAS, you know, going back maybe ten years ago, you had some thousands of calibratable parameters. Mm -hmm. To to today, we're seeing half a million as a as a number that appears in vehicles with a lot of this functionality. Um, and maybe that's even not representative of, of the most complex. And so there are large number of calibratable parameters. It's not something that any one person- You can't hold it in your you hand. You can't hold it in your hand. Yeah. And if you yeah. in the past had maintained it, maybe you know on a piece of paper not, <laughs> not, or on a spreadsheet, right? right. Maybe yeah. that type of approach you very quickly cannot easily manage that or you need a team of people to do that. And so this is where you need to look at tools that are in place for, for databases and security requirements and full you know, um, authentication authorization so that you have that transparency of who logged into the system, what change did they make, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. What maturity level was there of the calibration surrounding that, right? Because then at some point when it gets released, sure. you need to say, I'm 100% I'm, I'm confident that every parameter that needed to be calibrated was, and it was calibrated appropriately for the variant of the vehicle that I'm producing. <laughs> Sounds like a nightmare. It's, it's, it's a, <laughs> that's where I think when you look at, again, if we think about autonomous, right, there's been a lot of um, talk for a long time about we're going to have autonomous vehicles. I, mm -hmm. I, it reminds me of several conversations and other technologies in the past automotive related end. And I think the challenge is much larger than people originally had kind of anticipated. Um, yeah, you know, when you thought you'd get a bunch of smart people together who are really good software, you know, can write some really good software and, you know, have these ideal environments and it would be easy to deploy. And I think the reality is the world is far more complex. The, uh, the legal side, the implications are just so much more complex that um, the the challenge is just much greater than had been expected by by some. But I think that's part of the exciting thing that we have to deal with is because it takes you bring new people with new thoughts that challenge kind of the established norms, right? Mm -hmm. And and they have a vision of what they can do, and and maybe they weren't a hundred percent correct. But that's okay because they've they've I think pushed the rest of the industry to move a little bit faster and to try something that perhaps they would not have done had that other player not been around them. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's good for everyone. So